How's everybody doing this morning? Y'all doing good? I'm doing good. Besides, I almost really hurt my son yesterday. He's doing fine. But we were, uh, he's got one of those um, little electric four wheelers. And we live on a pretty steep hill. And, uh, and I didn't, I didn't think that, you know, I thought it had like a governor on it where if he started to go down the hill, he wouldn't be able to go that fast. And I didn't think he would actually do it. And so, but he, you know, edges over the edge and then all of a sudden just takes off. And then all of a sudden you see me full speed out of the garage chasing after my son. And I'm sitting here thinking, you know, you're always thinking about the neighbors as well. Like, what are they thinking this guy's doing? And unfortunately, Wit, he's only two, it, um, the foil, he turned, and all of a sudden, he just nails the concrete. And, I, and I'm like, oh, gosh, um, this is not good. And, and I'm thinking, I'm going to pick him up. There's going to be blood everywhere. And uh, I pick him up, start taking him back to the house, and he's really upset. And I thought he was upset because he was hurt. He was upset because he wanted to get back on the four-wheeler. <laughs> so he was fine. It scared me. I'm like, heart's racing. I'm like, ready to go to the hospital. I ran into a dump truck one time on my bicycle. My dad probably remembers that. So maybe it just brings back memories. I got 24 stitches in my head, cracked my skull. They said I was okay. I don't know. Y'all can tell me if I am or not. But so, yeah, let me just pray for us. Jesus, we love you. God, I love that you're, you're with us. God, I thank you that you're in this room. And God, I'm excited that we get to uh, baptize today. Uh, God, that we got the uh, we got the tank out, and uh, Lord, we, we get to celebrate uh, that the in, the enemy lost another one. Uh, God, we get to celebrate that somebody's gotten transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. God, we get to celebrate the victory of what you did on that cross today, Father. And Father, I just pray that even in this place, if there's anybody in here, uh, God, that doesn't know you or uh, wants to recommit their life to you, Father, I know that you're ministering and speaking to people's hearts today. And so, Father, we, we just pray for your love and your grace to be manifested in this place powerfully today. Yeah, we, we know it already is, but we just partner with what you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. We do get to baptize somebody today, and I do just want to tee this up, that if you've never been baptized or you want to be baptized or rededicate your life to God, uh, we do have some extra towels and shorts and shirts and stuff over there. Uh, I do want to just make that available to anybody today. If God begins to move in your heart that way, we'd love to baptize you. If you'd love to make a public declaration that you are a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, the baptism tank is always open. <laughs> At least it is once every six weeks or so. <laughs> um, so, so John chapter 4, I do have something I want to share uh, with you that has been stirring uh, in my heart. Uh, I, uh, I am doing uh, not a one-off, but a two-off here because I have been doing a sermon series on the power of community and building kingdom family. Uh, but today, uh, I'm not going to go in that direction. I'm going to go after something that I just feel like God is, is speaking uh, this morning and some of this has come out of, I've, I've noticed this in my own heart. I've just felt a stirring in my heart recently. I felt a conviction. I felt a uh, God asking me, what am I focused on? What is my source? Where There's so much distraction. There's so much room to go left, to go right. I mean, there's so much room right now for to be distracted. But I feel God is stirring. And I see this in my wife. I see this in some of our team. I see this just happening in the world. And I do believe that uh, as there's more... Uh, pressure or oppression, I, sometimes I just think what gets popped out is we just get hungry for Jesus. There's something about suffering. There's something about that that uh, we call on the name of Jesus, that there's something that our heart begins to cry out for more. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm going to go after this today. I'm going to be in John chapter 4, and I'm going to talk about the Samaritan woman. I, I do love this story as I've, I've been diving into this. I'm going to read a bunch of scripture, and then we'll dive into it. So John chapter 4. Verse 1, it says, When Jesus knew that the Pharisees heard that he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, just sounds like something the Pharisees would be aware of, that he was baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went again to Galilee. You know, I, I could unpack that a little bit, but we'll just let that be. It's interesting that the Pharisees are aware of this. And I think Jesus knew that he was going to have to confront uh, some of these religious rulers or leaders 
And so he leaves. He goes to Judea and went again to Galilee. And he traveled through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar. That's one way to pronounce it. Near the property that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about the sixth hour in the evening. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. So here comes this woman from Samaria. And Jesus says to her, give me a drink. Jesus said to her, for his disciples had gone into the town to buy food. How is it that you, so here's the Samaritan woman, how is it that you, talking to Jesus, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? She asked him, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Sir, says the woman, you don't have even a bucket and the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. Verse 13, Jesus said, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never thirst again ever. In fact, the water I will give him will become like a well of water springing up from within him for eternal life. Here's the woman again. Sir, woman, sir, the woman said to him, give me this water so I, I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. Here's Jesus again. Go call your husband, he told her, and come back here. She replies, I don't have a husband. Jesus says, you are correct in saying this. You don't, I, I don't have a husband for you have had five husbands, and the, the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Sir, the woman replied, I see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, yet you Jews say that, this, say that the place of worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus told her, Believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know the Messiah is coming who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. I think this is fascinating. Jesus says, I am. Jesus told her, the one you were speaking of. So he reveals, manifests himself to her as the Messiah. This is a fascinating scripture here. I want to I talk about three things that are culturally against this woman. One is, is that she's a Samaritan. She even says, you Jews don't associate with uh, Samaritans. So Jesus is coming to this woman who is a Samaritan, and you can see the rejection that's actually built in this woman. Like, she's ready to be rejected. She sees this Jew that's at the well, obviously doesn't know that this is the Messiah at this moment, and she's got rejection in her. She's ready to be rejected. She's like, hey, you guys, you Jews, y'all don't associate with us Samaritans. So you can see that there's a dislike here between the Samaritans and the Jews. I'll read this little commentary just to give some background on this. It says, this is some commentary. It says, when the southern kingdom of Judah was conquered by the Babylonians, they took almost every captive, exiling them to the Babylonian empire. All they left behind were the lowest classes of society because they didn't want that type in Babylon. These that were left behind any intermarried with other peoples who slowly became who came into the region and that region that he's talking about is the Samaritans. So the Samaritans emerged out of this. So the Babylonians left the low class kind of the outcast and what formed out of that was the people of Samaria. I'll read a little bit more. Because the Samaritans had a historical connection to the people of Israel, their faith was a combination of law and ritual from the law of Moses and various superstitions. Most Jews in Jesus' time despised the Samaritans even more than the Gentiles. That's a big statement because they were religiously speaking, they were like half-breads. You know, it's kind of like a dog, it's like a mutt. <laughs> you know, they're, they're the ones that had intermarried and pretty much what this meant to, to the Jews is, is that they're not pure, they're not clean. And so for them, they disliked the Samaritans. And here's Jesus, and it actually, if you actually look at this geographically from my understanding, 
the Jews, a lot of time, from where Jesus was coming from, would go around Samaria. They wouldn't even go through it. A lot of the pious or more um, devout religious Jews wouldn't even go through Samaria. They would actually go around it because they didn't want to associate with the Samaritans. But Jesus actually goes through it. Jesus goes to the well. He goes to the Samaritan woman, and he's not... Uh, rejecting her because because of her ethnicity, and if we get in today because of our political views or our background, religious background, whatever, Jesus doesn't reject her because of those things, but he's actually moving towards her in love, and he's actually loving her. Another thing that was culturally against her was that she was a woman. If you go study this out, and I did some research on this, I actually saw this one uh, from Chris Valentin, but he said that there's a, uh, a rabbi, Elzar, of that day, that says that he would rather burn the Torah than teach a woman. It just shows you like the level of, um, yeah, just the way they belittled, obviously, women. And that he wouldn't even, in that day, it even says, as things I was reading, some of the research I was doing was showing that men sometimes wouldn't even talk to women, especially rabbis to women. I mean, you just imagine that in our culture. Like, I mean, just how there was a... a, a culturally against her was one, that she was a Samaritan, and then two, that she was a woman. Even if you go through and read this, if you actually read some more down here, the disciples, when they arrived back, it says that they were amazed that he was even, it didn't say a Samaritan, it says that they were amazed that he was talking with a woman. As I kind of read through this, a lot of rabbis in that day would not teach women. And here's Jesus. Think about this. Here's Jesus. Not only is he teaching this, this woman, not only is he interacting with her, but he reveals to her that he is the Messiah. Like, I just think that is, that is so powerful that in this moment, like, one of, I mean, I don't know that there's a greater revelation that Jesus could have taught, that he could have revealed to himself. And he's sitting here with this woman, and he's with a Samaritan woman, and he is saying, I am the Messiah. And I just think that's fascinating and powerful because Jesus was the ultimate liberator of women. Come on. Amen. Come on. <laughs> Jesus was the ultimate liberator of women. He was. And <clears throat> also against this, against this Samaritan woman was that she was at the well by herself. This actually says something about, like, she's there. As I, I kind of researched this, I, like, they would come, like, families of people would come. Groups of women would come to the well to get water, obviously, uh, for their families. And she's there by herself. And she's there at the heat of the day. From my understanding, some translation says it's at noon. She's there at the like, hot part of the day, and she's there by herself. This reveals that she was an outcast. She's there by herself. So she's a Samaritan, a woman, and she's an outcast. And then Jesus, here's Jesus. He doesn't, uh, you can, if you read this through one lens, you can read it like he's sitting here calling out her sin. Like he's calling out like, hey, you had five husbands. I'm here. I'm condemning you. I'm calling out your fornication. But if you research this in their time, women actually could not divorce men. Only men could divorce women. So women couldn't actually divorce men. Or, or, did I say that right? Men could only divorce women. And so this woman has been divorced five times. He, she has been divorced five times. So Jesus He's saying, look, you have been rejected over and over and over again. So what Jesus is actually doing is he is moving towards her pain and loving her in the midst of the thing that she is most shameful about. The thing that she is so shameful about, like the thing that like she's probably obviously known as the outcast, is that she has been rejected and rejected and rejected and rejected. And even if you think about it in that context, Jesus is even like the man that you're with right now, He's not even willing to marry her. Like, she's there. Like, she's not married to him. And it's probably because the man's not willing to marry her. So this woman has, I mean, just rejection all over her. And here is our King Jesus. Like, I just think about this, how he made his way all the way to this well for this woman. Like, he made his way. Like, if, I mean, he, he came to show her and love her in the middle of her pain in the middle of being a Samaritan, a woman, and an outcast, here is Jesus giving her an opportunity to drink from the everlasting well, which is him. Like, I mean, just, I mean, even for you and me, you know, if you think of despite, it doesn't matter what we've done, doesn't matter the shame we carry, the sin that we've done, whatever it is, despite all of that, God loves us. 
despite everything. It doesn't matter where we are today. It doesn't matter what we've done, what we did yesterday. It doesn't matter. Like our God, He loves us, and He is He is actually coming towards us. I mean, I just think about like I, I just feel like God knew this. He was like, I know there's a woman that is rejected, and I'm going to go teach my disciples even how to treat people, how to love people, how to bring healing and reconcile to people. I mean, if we if we bring that into our day to day, and you take that to our own selves, what does that look like for us? Who are the people that we should actually be loving? That in in essence, the church is judged. Like, who is the people that we actually should be moving towards in love? Like, Jesus didn't go throw rocks at this lady. Jesus went, and he loved her in her pain. And if you go read the story, it's fascinating because, like, so many people end up believing God because this woman goes back to Samaria, and she begins to share about what God, Jesus, had done in her heart, which is awesome. So, come on, Jesus. He loves us. Despite where we are, what we've done, he loves us. And we should love others that way. I do want to talk for a second about this thing because I feel like this is what God is calling us into. And I feel like this is prophetic for us. I think it's prophetic uh, just moment is Jesus says, if you knew the gift that was standing before you, you would ask of me a drink. If you knew the gift that was standing before you, and I believe I love this about God. The more I think about this, how many of you know that God didn't come this time on a white horse, walking around with a sword, 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 walking around with a sword, telling everybody, bow down before me? He didn't come in like he could have. I, I even think about the story when Judas and the centurions and the Roman soldiers were coming to find Jesus, and it's fascinating that they still took him. <laughs> but when, I don't know if you know that story, I can't remember which gospel it's in, but when they were there and they, G, G, Judas had betrayed Jesus, and the Roman soldiers are there to come get Jesus. And the soldiers said, which one is he? Talking about which one is Jesus. And when he said, I am, all it says they all fell down. It says they all fell down. Like in that moment when he said, I am, all of a sudden it says in that scripture that they all fell back. Like I, that just shows you that if God wanted to, if Jesus wanted to in that moment, he could have called down everything he wanted to and stopped them. But he chose to lay down his life. And I believe that in this moment, like God is, and, and this to me reveals the nature of who God is, is that he is not forcing us into relationship. He's not manipulating us into it. He's not holding a gun against our heads and saying, you better follow me. Like he could have done that. That could have been God. But he came down because this is true love, and it reveals the nature of God. And he says, if you just knew the gift that was standing in front of you, you would ask of me. And I believe that's true right now in this moment, even for believers, non-believers, all of us, that there is a gift that it's available, and I feel it in my own heart, that I feel that God is asking us to lose the distraction, and he's asking us, what is our focus? What is our source right now? And I see this in people's hearts right now that are leaning into God. They are tasting of that eternal life. They're tasting of what God is doing and how many of you know, I just, I just think about this, is that if God fully manifested himself in his glory right now, it wouldn't, there wouldn't be a question. You wouldn't have an option. Every knee would bow. Every tongue would confess. If God fully manifested his glory, the presence and power of God, I think, I think it would be a response of like all my, I think we would just be in awe of who he is. But I believe that God actually withholds himself from us to some degree so that we actually have a choice, so that we're not robots, so that we actually can be a part of relationship with him and be invited into the gift of God that he is. And what is he inviting us into? I believe this is what he's inviting us into. And he goes into this, that, that he says, one day you're not going to worship in Samaria you're not going to worship in Jerusalem. You're going to worship in spirit and in truth. And you're going to worship. It's not about a building. It's not about, it's not about even the band or the team. It's not about if it's an acoustic set or a full-on set. It's not about like, it, it, it doesn't matter where and what style it is. It doesn't matter it, what, <clears throat> what it looks like. What matters is, is that it's done and I think truth, if you kind of look up that word, it's actually a purity. It's an authentic worship. It's actually God is looking for people that are pure in heart. That I don't have a motive like, 
I mean, the, the, the truth is, is, is <clears throat> honestly, I could be jumping up and down and shouting, or I could be sitting down and God could have my heart. I could be, actually, I could be screaming and shouting up here or sitting down and God couldn't have my heart. It doesn't, it, the, the truth is, I, I could be, it doesn't matter what team is actually leading me in worship. Like, what, what matters is, is my purity and my devotion to God. It's an authentic place. And I think that's what God is calling us into in this place of, of He wants a, a people that are authentically, that are worshiping in spirit and in truth, where the goal, like, what, you want to know what determines our worship, what should determine our worship? It's not the band, it's not the team, it's Him. What determines my worship for me in my own heart is my big God that I'm serving. Like that's what determines the worship that I have, the surrendered heart. I mean, it's like who cares about whatever. It's like, God, I just want you, and that's what I want, and I want that. And I believe God's inviting us into a place of that. And so I just want you to imagine that you're you're the woman at the well, that we're the woman at the well, and that you're there. And here, I love that the, the picture of this is actually a well that, you know, Jesus is the never-ending drink. You know, Jesus, he, 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 he never ends. He never stops pouring out himself on us. I think about my own life. I think about 20 years ago, he was pouring himself out on me. I think about mom, all throughout my life, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, one year ago, today, last week. I mean, I'm sitting in worship, just tears are flowing through my eyes just because of who God is. Like God is just, he is a never-ending well. He's the gift that keeps on giving. It doesn't end. He's just a gift. That, that's eternal life. And personally, I don't think eternal life is only the afterlife. I think eternal life is actually something that we can live in today. I do think it obviously talks about the eternal life aspect, but I believe he wants to give us eternal life right now and where we're just devoted and connected to him. And I think Farrah was talking about that in the closing that I think God, for me, I can just say this for me, I, I can tell, I feel convicted about things that used to be okay that I don't think they're okay anymore. I feel like there's things that I, that I used to sort of, and it's, it's not like sin, it's not, and it could be that for people, and that, that, that's okay. It's like, but I think there's just, I can tell in my own life that I wake up convicted, like, man, where is my focus, where is my time? Am I, am I staring at my phone? Am I, what, where, what, what's got my attention in this moment right now? And I just feel like God is calling us into this place of devotion to Him. So if you're able, can you stand with me? <clears throat> I'm about to have Lynn come up. I'm so excited for for Lynn. I got to connect with her before uh, church, and man, God has just wrecked her life. (laughs) God has just got a hold of her heart, and it's so beautiful to see this. Y'all have the team come back up. I am going to have, if I talk to you about being a prayer servant, can you come up as well? I'm going to have some prayer servants up here on my left as well. Um, And we are going to baptize Lynn. I do just want to a couple things. If you need prayer today for anything, if God's moving your heart, you need a miracle in your body, you need encouragement, we got a team over here that we would love to pray for you in any way that we can. And, uh, and also, we're going to be baptizing somebody. If there's anybody here that, that wants to be baptized, that wants just to make a public declaration of your faith, again, we've got some towels and shirts and stuff. And Farah over here, Farah, we wave. That's Farah. You can go, you can connect with him. Um, once we're doing the baptism, if you want to get baptized, you can walk over here and connect with him, and he'll uh, just lead you from there. But I want to make that available, because really what this is, what baptism is, is one, it's a public declaration of my faith in Christ. It's saying, hey, I'm going to be a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ, and I'm going to follow him. And I'm making that a public um, proclamation of that. I also believe that in this water, that it's a representation of the old man dying, the old woman dying, and the new one being raised to life. It's a picture of us being transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. It's It's a picture of the old self dying and the new creation being resurrected. You know, I was just thinking about this, and then I'm gonna have Lynn come up. Jesus, I just, I want you, for some reason, this was personal to me that today, Jesus died for me. Like, Jesus died for me. Like, I I just want you to think about that in your own life. Like, Jesus died for you. Like, he died. Like, God in heaven came to this earth, and he chose to die for us 
all that suffering, all that pain. I mean, to me, it was just like God. It's like, Jesus, I want to follow a God like that. I want to follow a king, a, a, a savior that was willing to die for me. He didn't come force me into this thing. He came and laid down his life in the most, I mean, crazy, painful way because he loved us.